Maybe we should close the door. Maybe I uh, don't whoever can say. I turn on the audio. Turn on audio. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's start. So welcome everyone. We are continuing our AIA series, um, AIA first project series tonight at the office of Hong Kong-based um, practice collective. So uh, they say there's a first thing for everything. So tonight, actually, the first time we do a uh, hybrid format um, for this series. So some of us are here um, at the Office of Collective and we also have members joining us from um, Hong Kong and all around the world online on Zoom. Tonight, um, I'm gonna really quickly introduce our speakers, four directors of um, Office Collective, the Betty. Hi. <laughs> um, Chien. Uh, Juan is joining us online. Hello. And Katya. Hi. And after our um, after the presentation, we will be joined by me from Taipei for like a, for a discussion um, afterwards. So without further ado, maybe we can start. Betty. Sure. I I'm just going to um, <laughs> speak quickly about the format today. Um, it will be myself, Chi, Katia, Juan. Um, the majority of the lecture will be will be by myself, so to just make it easier. But in between, Min will join and present a project that we work together. Uh, we think um, today we would love to stir up some discussion. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we do ask a particular question that we would love uh, the audience to initiate and answer and give opinions. Um, the second thing is that we would like to um, also, the reason that we invited Min to also come over is uh, we want to also speak about the idea of collaboration, uh, particularly about, uh, well, between young firms. So um, also bear with me uh, a bit. Uh, today uh, for our presentation, uh, we will actually uh, do more like an overview rather than uh, having a very in-depth uh, kind of discussion on particular projects. Uh, but of course, if you have any question about a particular project, we'll be more than happy to, to go through it. Um, I would like to first start by this image. Um, I'm sure everyone know what this is. Uh, you can probably immediately spread out um, you know, who the artist is, who's the author. Obviously, everyone will think, oh, that's a Jeff Koons sculpture. But for us, what is interesting is uh, Jeff Koon has a huge team. And we always sort of use this set of images to describe what does collective mean. Uh, we have a very generic office name. And uh, a lot of people ask us, uh, why do you call yourself collective? Uh, this is one of the biggest inspiration because um, Katia, Juan, Chi, and myself, we all work, we have worked in very famous big offices uh, in, with senior positions. And I think what inspire us the most is actually the team and the people we work with. Um, this is collective in the beginning, 2015, before Zoom is the way to work. Uh, we were already using Skype and Google Meet. Um, when I left Rotterdam, um, I was approached by team members from OMA uh, in my team. Uh, they all started working in other places, in different location. Uh, they wanted to do a competition. It was very interesting. It was a bunch of very young architects and they thought, let's contact Betty because Betty can lead us through this competition. Uh, I actually rejected um, the proposal in the beginning because I was like, I don't have the capacity to produce. Uh, I'm running my own office alone right now. Uh, but they made a very interesting point to me that Betty, we actually need a project leader because we realized that they will probably fall into arguments and debate and without, able to, without being able to produce a competition on time. And they thought having worked with me um, prior in Rotterdam, they thought I would be a good candidate to help them uh, go through a competition. So that was actually the first, let's say, um, formation of collective. 2016, um, I approached 
Juan and Cartier, and then we started in a Chinese walk-up. Um, it's a very small space, 300 square feet. Uh, there was three of us and also one summer intern from Hong Kong U. Uh, that's where we actually started the office. We're very lucky. By 2017, we moved to um, the current building we're in right now on the ninth floor. We are on the 11th floor uh, at this moment. Uh, we have a small team of eight people and we started doing projects. But by 2018, we were really hustling. We were working all over in the world, uh, in New York, uh, in San Francisco, in uh, Milan, uh, in, San, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and that was the moment that we were really sensing that idea and that difficulty of growth. Uh, at the same time, because of the complexity of project we are getting, uh, we started working with more different kinds of clients. We approached mentors. Uh, we also started working with a, you know, various kind of collaborators. We even initiate collaboration. For example, um, in the lower row in the middle, that's actually Atelier Bowell. We have invited them to Hong Kong to work on a project with us. Uh, unfortunately, the project uh, got canceled. But again, it was about this kind of like network that uh, we created. By 2021, which is right now, we're very lucky that we can move into a much bigger space. Um, and we have a very, let's say, a very stable team. Uh, we continue kind of creating this momentum of design. Um, but then you see the images down there. We thought that was actually very important because creating a culture has become almost a quintessential way to create a good team. And uh, a lot of the times we use, let's say, eating, drinking uh, as a casual way to exchange ideas or even uh, things that they're not happy about. <laughs> So um, by 2021 uh, is on our sixth year. We have a team of around 17 right now. We were at our height of 21 uh, just not so long ago. Uh, and after the summer, quite a few of them went back to school. Actually, there's quite a few GSD uh, people here. Uh, we're quite happy that uh, quite a few of them go to our, um, our school. So um, the story of collective, uh, probably people who know us, I uh, know there's four directors. And um, I'll explain a little bit our kind of in intricate network of how do we know each other. So uh, Katia, uh, we, I know Katia through OMA. Uh, and Katia is a graduate of Chinese U. And then uh, Juan and I knew each other at Harvard. And then we came to Hong Kong and Juan joined OMA. Uh, and I came to Hong Kong and helped out the Hong Kong office. And prior to OMA, I was at Herzog and Jimmy Ron. And Chi and, and myself and Juan, we all went to the GSD and we overlapped. But then Chi went directly to HDM um, and uh, Dai Gun is a project that brought her to Hong Kong for many years. So um, now I will uh, let Katia um, maybe talk a little bit about yeah. herself. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Katia. Uh, I am a graduate from Chinese U. So after graduation, I joined OMA, that's how I met. At that time. So in on OMA, I work on numerous of um, competition and uh, quite a lot of interior projects. And uh, the like the last project I work on is the Shanghai uh, Exhibition uh, Center in, in Buja uh, that I was leading the interior design. And uh, the first project is actually the West Common Cultural District project. That, that's how I met Patty and then we work closely together. Yeah, that's the. Um... <laughs> and then Juan, maybe you can give a little bit of introduction of yourself. Unmute. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was unmute. Hi, I'm Juan. Uh, I'm from Spain, uh, where I got. Uh, I mean, I, I, where I got my architecture degree, and where I worked for a while before uh, going to the US to continue studying and where I met uh, Betty and, and actually Min. Uh, I moved to Hong Kong from the US uh, uh, around the time when OMA was opening the, their office here. And I worked with uh, OMA for a while, mostly on the Chu Hai College uh, project, which unfortunately uh, didn't get to happen. Uh, well, I, I, I worked for a number of years in OMA. Uh, after that, uh, I joined uh, SOIL to actually work in a project in Hong Kong uh, for the 
Musea complex, the, the, this uh, uh, curved glass uh, tube uh, facade. And after that, uh, in 2016, I joined uh, Collective and, and here we are. And then she, hi everyone, I'm Chi. Um, so I'm, I'm the newest member of, of the, the director crew, let's say. So I joined um, uh, the team here in two, 2019 um, after um, leaving Herzog and Demeron um, in 2018, which I was there for 10 years, a little over 10 years, um, which was um, what brought me to Hong Kong, um, as Betty mentioned, uh, worked on uh, the project, uh, the Dai Gun project for approximately nine years of my time at um, Herzog and Demeron, and then also had a had a chance to uh, work for a short while on uh, the M plus project during construction. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's 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 a very um, uh, interesting and eye opening sort of transition for me also having having worked in sort of a large company for many years and then sort of joining a smaller growing um, office that is also just starting to shape itself and, and its sort of office culture. So a little bit of myself, I'm Betty. Um, I actually attended Chinese University of Hong Kong for my first year, and then uh, I transferred to Cornell. I did my professional degree at Cornell, uh, and then I went to work a little bit um, at OMA New York, and then I attended the GSD doing an MRC2. That's where I met Juan. Uh, and I believe I overlapped with, with Chi, right? Yeah, but then we didn't, we were not friends at that time in school. Uh, I did work at Herzog and Jumeirah for a year, uh, but then I decided to go back to OMA. Um, so I, my last position at OMA was design director with RAM in Rotterdam, uh, where I have led um, likely a team of 40 people with uh, Alain Foro. Uh, we have one competition like Axel Springer, which is built, completed right now, uh, which is amazing to see. Uh, and then 2015, I came back to Hong Kong uh, and opened our own firm. Um, in 2015, as I have also shown you guys earlier, um, we started hustling by just kind of working with people we know. Uh, I consider this our first project. Our first project is about forming the team. It's not necessarily about making the architecture or designing things. Uh, it was, I think forming a good team has always been a preoccupation we have until now. And when we were given this opportunity to do this lecture, that was the first thing that came into our mind is that our first project is forming the team. Um, but then indeed the first team created a project. And of course, uh, as all architecture, small architecture firm goes, it's a competition that you probably won't win. So we did the Bauhaus Museum competition. Uh, we were quite preoccupied about the idea of having an overview of an exhibition because exhibition is always on a you know, human scale eye. You never see the whole of an exhibition in one go. And the site is also located in the park. And we were thinking that we don't want to do a building that is completely overwhelming. It's located at the corner of a park. So we wanted to do a one story building. So we decided to dig in and created a exhibition space that is all about flexibility. Um, and we have studied various configurations. We actually went through the whole kind of Bauhaus uh, collection to understand what kind of exhibition space will make sense. Um, so the idea is that you come in, you first encounter a full view of the exhibition, and then you dive in, you go in, become you know, part of the, the show and see the objects uh, with a more human scale and eye level. Of course, um, then the second project comes which is obviously through friends' recommendation. Uh, we did a meat freezer room in Hong Kong, uh, in Bo Tan area. And uh, we were so lucky that we got a DFA award, a silver award for this project. And it was the first time ever we have submitted an award. Um, and then we won one competition in our lifetime, I guess, in the last six years, is the Asia Art Archive Open Platform. Uh, with this project, uh, it was, uh, sort of initiated by myself uh, to try to work on a very small scale competition. Uh, and then uh, we were joined by uh, Ying Zhou, who's currently a professor at Hong Kong U. Uh, and then we kind of brought this project forward together with a graphic designer, a friend of ours, uh, Lila Sulaiman from Shanghai. And at this point of our practice, we were thinking, 
Um, how do you actually get projects? Uh, when I left OMA, I did not take any of my clients' contact away, nor did I contact any of my old clients. And I came across this uh, career connection of major American architects. We found this diagram extremely interesting. I believe every single person here uh, in this lecture, you can all do a diagram like this, and probably all our names will be on your diagram. Uh, and that makes us realize a lot is about people you know, people you trust, and people you can form a bond with. Our first patron is actually Venus Lau. Uh, she was then uh, artistic director at OCAT Shenzhen. All these shows I put on this slide, we did it. We have done many, many exhibitions with her. Uh, and when she went to K11 Art Foundation as the artistic director, because of the previous collaboration we had, she really enjoyed it. We continue our collaboration. And um, that created a trajectory for, for our office as a beginning. We become almost specializing in exhibition design. Uh, our second project was with uh, Eric Chan, uh, M plus um, lead curator. Um, our first project with M plus is actually shifting objective. It was uh, the first ever exhibition uh, done by M plus showcasing the collection of design and architecture. Um, so we managed to sort of get a step into working with institution through this project and also locally in Hong Kong. Step by step, uh, we start to work well, so-called internationally. Uh, we had a chance to work with Hans Ulrich Obrist and Dr. Yong Wu Li uh, on a project in Shanghai called the Shanghai Project. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie, uh, it was through a recommendation of RAM um, that Hans is doing a project in China and he wanted to work with people that are you know, young, energetic, um, and design driven, so we were recommended. Uh, this project means a lot to us, obviously, because phase one was actually done by So Fujimoto. Um, it's a very, very well received project in Shanghai uh, in the context of China. Uh, we were commissioned to do phase two, which is an interior project, a 4,000 square meter big exhibition, uh, in which we managed to actually participate almost in also like a curatorial role together with Hans and Dr. Lee. Uh, in suggesting location, are ticketed, not ticketed, uh, what kind of program we can do. Um, and it, it become a very, very fruitful collaboration and leads to quite a few others um, later on. Um, one of the patrons of ours, Jeffrey Shaw, ex dean and chair uh, of the Create School of Creative Media in City University, um, he received recommendation from some of his friends, uh, seeing all the other exhibitions we have done prior. And he had this pretty difficult exhibition um, with real authentic letters of Tsinghua scholars. Um, you know, they were the people who pushes the modernization of China and they were writing letters to each other. Um, so these are authentic old, um, let's say artifacts that are being exhibited in a non-museum environment. Um, we were commissioned to work on uh, this exhibition and Jeffrey has allowed us to go pretty crazy on this. And we have created 30 special vitrines to host these letters. And in each vitrine, which is a table, you can actually read the conversation of the scholars talking to each other. Um, with all these exhibition, we moved on, we managed to move on uh, to work on some uh, interior projects that are art related. Um, we, our first gallery project um, that is under collective, because uh, all of us prior has worked on galleries and museum. But Under Collective is actually for Esquil, uh, one of the biggest textile company in Hong Kong. Uh, and they have built a gigantic campus um, by Ronalu and Partners. Uh, and we were commissioned to work on a small gallery to renovate um, what has already been built in there. Um, probably this will be one of the most exciting commissions we have received. And we did not manage to talk about it in the last three years that we were working on it. Um, it's the M plus East galleries. We were designing the opening display, the exhibition um, for M plus Museum, which is going to open on the 12th of November this year. So I can't show you pictures, but we have went all the way to uh, conceptualization, to creating uh, drawing sets. Uh, and this is the floor plan that we have come up with with the curators. Uh, it will be a very exciting show. There's a lot of amazing collection that you guys as architects would love to see it. For example, the Archigram collection. And it's almost inevitable that in Hong Kong, we feel like the first step to make architecture is to probably get commissioned a commercial podium. 
um, obviously Hong Kong is filled with um, private development and uh, it does seems like uh, a lot of developers tend to cut their building up in different pieces to let different parties design it. Um, I'm not complaining, but we did, you know, this is the first architecture project that was commissioned to us uh, as a commercial podium in some struggle area. And uh, unfortunately it was canceled. So we finished concept design, uh, it didn't go through. So uh, the office was kind of devastated. We have a big team in place, everyone's hired. It was the moment, it's, you know, one of the growing pains of a small office is what should we do right now? We started doing competitions. So um, we participated in a residential power competition. Uh, this one is in Central. Unfortunately, we lost it. And then we started participating in public competition, the WKCB Pavilion, uh, which uh, the last talk was by um, New Office Works. They won the competition. So we are the losers here. <laughs> and our idea for the pavilion is actually to create a, this integrated piece of almost like a canopy um, that it opens up itself for different programs. Uh, it can allow a different direction to, of, of programs to happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have two things we want to do. Number one is to make use of the whole plinth instead of building one building. But the second thing is we actually wanted to create a shadow, a moving shadow um, for public. Because we ourselves realize it's so hot there. Like no one wants to get out there because there's no shade. So um, the conceptual intention was to actually create a moving shadow um, to host people. Oh, obviously we lost. So we move on and then we started doing competition in New York. Um, a lot of us went to New York, uh, Chi Huan and myself, we had lived there. It's a very dear place to us. And this interesting competition came in place. People who have lived in New York know exactly where this is. This is the Chinatown tourist pavilion that looks like a Chinese temple. And they launched a competition to redesign this and they call it the gateway of Chinatown. So for us, it was very simple. We wanted to do a urban furniture, but at the same time, we can also keep that usage of a tourist pavilion. Um, so what we did is to extrude, push, pull, and create a furniture that also at the same time is a, uh, it's a public kind of bench for everyone to sit on. Obviously we lost. Well, we keep going. We did one of the biggest competitions we have ever tried. Uh, which is a almost like a cityscape scale. It's as long as New York State. It's 800 kilometers long. Um, it's called Reimagine the Canal. Um, we have done master plan before, uh, and at the same time, I have to be honest, it was one of the way that we can keep the team intact. We don't have any job. We didn't have any jobs at that time, um, but we want to keep the team. We had a very good team, so we started launching this kind of research um, uh, effort in looking into New York State Erie Canal. So we start zooming in, we looked at every locks in the canal, uh, and then we, we were quite mesmerized about how boring it is actually, but at the same time, how potentially exciting it can be. So we conglomerate all the findings we have, uh, and we started creating our own kind of like cycle analysis on the canal. We created this whole mapping of program, population, infrastructure, altitude changes, all the you know, monuments and everything you can think of about upstate New York along the Erie Canal. And we created this thing called a canal character map, which is a guidebook for ourselves to understand the 800 kilometer situation. And we created what we call in quote a subway map. We created a cultural tourism guidebook uh, and we handpicked 24 cities, um, locating what is interesting in the arts, in the nature, in its accommodation and commerce, because the whole idea is to learn from the Satoshi model of cultural tourism. And um, we went forward and looked into every single town we have picked, that, uh, thus the name Canal 24. So uh, Waterford uh, is the beginning of the canal. Uh, the idea of this master plan is to suggest that artwork, commission, uh, and architecture can happen. So um, we started looking into places that are in the middle of nowhere, for example, uh, and you can create a campsite. Because the idea of cultural tourism is not about art only, it's about reviving businesses, that you can also do other things. 
So Fairport is a very quaint little town. Um, there's a lot of people living there. So we wanted to create things that the community can use also in the summer and winter. And also um, uh, Medina is where uh, actually sandstone were being made. So there's a lot of, uh, right now the, the, the kind of like quarry situation has totally died down and they still have a lot of industrial building that are empty. So we suggested that artwork can be commissioned and create art institution. Uh, Lockport uh, is a very popular tourist site because it has a double lift lock. And so we wanted to create um, uh, places that tourists can come. Um, we did lose the competition in the end, but among the 150 um, candidates, we actually entered the final. We were one of the seven teams that managed to enter the final. We went through a whole ordeal of presenting in New York, uh, meeting the governor, uh, Hong Kong, uh, sorry, New York Power Authority. It was extremely exciting. We travel uh, all the time and we try to present it and we entered phase two and then we lost. So how did we sustain uh, through all these losses? We started doing interiors and we became quite well known locally in Hong Kong for retail. So uh, this is a determined store for Beijing, um, which we managed to test some extremely conceptual ideas. Uh, this is one white shirt, 48 sizes. How do you sell one white shirt? So we created a trunk, like the trunk show, and it's a cube that can open up uh, and create different moments of display. We got commissioned by Falestra, a luxury leather goods company, but to build in Honolulu, while it's operated by Falestra Japan. Uh, it was an extremely exhausting project, but very, very fun. Uh, we're very grateful we got this chance. Um, it's a very, very beautiful project, we think. And we were very lucky to got an AI award last year uh, with this project. We started doing commercial interiors. Tatla Asia headquarters is designed by us. Uh, it was a 10,000 square feet space. Uh, and we managed to also test ideas of bringing garden indoors. We created a 20 meter long interior garden here. And then we started establishing relationships. Uh, all four stores in Kapok, a Hong Kong lifestyle um, uh, retail place, um, commissioned us to work on all four of their location for their kind of branding revamp. And that brought us to New York. Uh, we designed the ONS store, which has a close relationship with Kapok. And we managed to um, start working overseas, also after Falestra in Honolulu. Having said that, uh, the interior project helped our uh, office a lot during the time of uh, having no, let's say, big commission. Uh, but we still continue working on a lot of exhibitions. That trajectory of working on arts and culture have never stopped. And then we work uh, in Shanghai with Power Station of Art. It's an amazing big show, 4,000 square meter with the international artists and foundation like Yves Klein, uh, Chinese artist Deng Yi, and uh, Korean artist Liu Huan. And also, again, with M Plus, uh, through with their architecture and design department uh, on the Southeast Asian collection. Uh, and we continue to work with artists. We create this work uh, as a consortium together, seen as an artist group with Lam Dong Ha in the mills. Uh, but one of the most exciting um, a continuation of the trajectory of arts and culture is to work on the Taipei Biennale, um, co-directed by Bruno Latour and uh, Martin Ganou. Uh, obviously, Bruno is, is a hero uh, for us. Uh, he's a French philosopher, and we met him during Shanghai Project with Hans Ulrich August. Uh, so they remember us. They like our work. And they commissioned us to work on uh, what they call the new diplomatic encounter, basically a workshop space. That will be a lecture space, a learning space. Uh, it's a place that you host people. So because of the name of it, New Diplomatic Encounters, we got very interested in uh, researching what a diplomatic space is. How do people negotiate? So we run a full research on different kind of like architectural floor plans of how people actually negotiate in architecture and spaces. And we come up with sort of what we call types of parliament. And uh, the result of it is basically a combination of such. And we created this gigantic spiral in the space that was used in various ways. Uh, by Bruno and Martin when they're hosting their workshop and lectures. So by here, um, our office managed to obviously survive. We didn't fire anyone. We created a body of work that we feel very proud of, very interesting. And finally, we got very lucky. 
we were commissioned our first architecture project in Hong Kong. And the project is in Kowloon uh, with New World Development. And this is the project site. At that time, uh, our office is still rather small. Um, and Katia, Juan, and I were leading basically all the projects. We were doing the conceptual effort. We brought this particular project uh, all the way through schematic design. And we realized we need to start thinking of implementation. And that was the time um, she left Harsan and Jimmy Ron and um, we recruited her. We invite her to join us and uh, to begin that journey of project implementation. And here I will let she uh, continue with um, talking about this very special project that today we can talk about. <laughs> Thanks, Betty. <laughs> uh, so this, this project has just gone public, uh, so to speak. We, we were um, able to uh, publish it for the first time in Taiwan Architecture Magazine. Um, and uh, so we're, we're now allowed to speak a lot more openly about it and also show uh, some of the images that we've been working on um, for the last two, two, the last two, two and a half years that I've been here. Um, so the project is um, located in Laizikok. Uh, in, in Kowloon, uh, and Laisikok is actually a older uh, industrial district in Hong Kong. It's sort of at the edge, the northern edge of Kowloon. Um, it's still uh, considered close to central in Hong Kong, meaning you can take um, the subway there within a matter of about 20 minutes. Um, what's really interesting about this location is that um, uh, it's considered one of the potential uh, Kowloon CBDs um, in the near future. A lot of um, offices, a lot of people who want um, offices, um, uh, uh, central offices um, are actually moving over to the Kowloon side because they're being priced out of uh, central. So this is one of the opportunities that our client uh, New World is taking advantage of is to actually um, start uh, quite a few developments in this area of, of, of Kowloon. So what you see here is really a collaboration um, between us and also Rocco Design Architects, RDA. Um, they are the executive architects for this project. Uh, they were commissioned first. Um, they are the designers of uh, the Twin Towers that you see. Um, and the collective, the, the scope that collective has is essentially the podium design and also the interior design of the office lobby and the public areas of uh, the office space in the tower. Um, so what you see here is really the mainly the podium portion, which um, our team has been working on um, very hard for the last few years. Um, the concept of it um, is quite simple. So the massing of the project was really already set initially by, by RDA uh, since they worked on the massing and the towers. Um, what's really interesting about this site is it actually takes up two lots of what is a very traditional sort of smaller industrial lot in Kowloon. Um, what you're able to do by taking up two lots in this case is actually free up a little bit of space in the center of what normally in Hong Kong would be a massive podium project. Um, so I think this was a great move uh, on the part of the client in a way to take a larger lot, but then allow it to be opened up. Um, if you have been to this part of Kowloon, um, you know that's very, very dense. Um, all the buildings are very, very tightly packed together. Um, and you can also see that it actually sits right at the edge of um, the city and also uh, this country park behind it. Um, so it has a very interesting boundary situation in which you have the green immediately to the back and then you have the city to the front. So what you, what you see here is a very simple diagram in which um, the design uh, concept is that we inserted um, uh, what we call the feature stair in the middle of this lot. The stair itself is a parametric uh, exercise in creating not just a circulation and a connection, but also a space where you can have seats and planters and people can actually sit around um, and just hang out in this area. Um, and then with uh, the, the pixelation, we also introduced it um, as a landscape concept throughout the second level of this entire podium. So that in a way there's a connection with the greenery um, from the backside of the site down into the city. Um, so here are some uh, renderings that we've been working on. It gives you an idea of um, this sort of bringing the green that is very sort of always adjacent to us um, when we're in Hong Kong down a little bit more into the city. 
this is a view of the space at night. Um, so indeed, in the end, it is a very commercial project. And um, it is quite a different uh, insertion, you can say, into what is a much more industrial fabric of Leipzig Hawk. Uh, this is a view of what you would see uh, looking down from the towers, uh, very much emphasizing on this central sort of new gathering space. Um, now, as we were working on the project, uh, what, what became even more exciting is the client actually, um, I think, recognized the potential of, of this sort of public space, um, this feature stair, and they then asked us to think about how we can further uh, use the space actually underneath the stair. So when we first got the project, actually, um, the space below was just considered to uh, potentially be rented out for retail. Um, but I think, I think we were all excited by the potential of what you could actually create under this space. So essentially right now it's, it's developed into a auditorium space. Um, and what's very exciting is that because the stairs actually has sort of two different levels, um, the idea is that we would also create two different types of auditorium spaces. We call it the upper and the lower auditorium. And the idea is you could use these two spaces um, um, collectively together or you could separate them and use them as two separate spaces. Um, so these are again some of the images um, fresh off the press um, and I think the, the exciting thing for us is that uh, we are able to um, take what is you know a very exciting architectural project for us but then also use a lot of the experiences that we've learned doing a lot of interior spaces into and also a very exciting interior space in this particular project. And uh, I shall continue to elaborate a little more on uh, our relationship with our first architecture patron, uh, Neuro Development. Uh, we managed to create a very close relationship with them. And throughout the last three and a half years for this particular project at King Lam Street, uh, we, I think we have created such a, a bond uh, and they understand the way we design. We were commissioned a second project. And uh, today I get an okay to present this project briefly uh, by the client. So um, I'm sure people hear about the Sky City project in the airport, uh, which is almost like a 3.8 million square feet of retail uh, currently under construction. Um, around more than a little bit a year ago, we were approached by the client to reconsider, help them reconsider how you can make use of a rooftop garden. So um, we were, commissioned to actually design a rooftop event space. And this particular image, I capture it from their current website. So um, that's why today I get an okay to talk a little bit about it because it's sort of out in the open. <laughs> uh, this is what we have proposed. It's a 4,000 square meter outdoor space. Uh, so you can see a tiny speck of a human as a scale there. It's a very, very big rooftop. And uh, it is a mechanical floor. And so uh, we have decided to internalize the whole, uh, let's say outdoor space by creating a internal facade. So we are actually doing a facade, but it's facing the outside and you occupy the outside. So it's almost like a reverse building. Uh, and we're gonna have a full mirror situation with landscape. And um, the idea is almost kind of like creating this vessel of a um, isolated landscape that has an infinity uh, reflection. So uh, it is a pretty crazy project and there's a lot of beautiful landscape happening and uh, we really have to give credits to the client uh, taking on this feat because uh, it's also a very complex facade um, system that we are designing. Uh, the client take it very seriously, they work with us, uh, we have created models uh, to you know understand the reflection and uh, we really think the client is really part of the team here. Uh, they gave a lot of advice and they really want this to happen. And here I would like to introduce Min. Uh, Min is our classmate from the GSD. And uh, hello, Min. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Happy to be here. <laughs> yes, we are very excited to have Min with us because uh, Min's a very good friend. Uh, Min opened his own office in Taipei. He's from Malaysia. Uh, he worked at Big before in Copenhagen. Uh, and Min approached us to do a competition together. And that's why I would like to pass the time to Min for him to speak about the presentation. Min, I'll let you share screen. Okay. Um, 
you would have to enable uh, yes. sharing for a moment. Yes, got it. You should be able to do it now. All right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, AIA Hong Kong, for the uh, invitation uh, to speak. And then uh, and uh, thank you very much, Betty, to uh, uh, bring me on to uh, uh, speak a little bit about this competition. So as Betty had mentioned, I'm uh, Malaysian by birth, but uh, I had spent most of my time in Singapore and the United States. And then uh, for many years in Denmark as well, and then now we've moved to uh, type, type A. And the reason we were here was because uh, when we were at BIG, I was a project architect for this uh, very large uh, project, residential project in Hua Lien. And uh, in a way, we moved here with the project to be closer to the client and our collaborators. Um, and so the project is um, uh, on hold at the moment. So we were very free and we had opened up our office. Uh, and um, for me, we, our, our company maintained uh, strong ties, our re past relationships, uh, especially with our previous clients and previous collaborators. And in, uh, I think one day uh, we got a call from our uh, this, uh, architect in Malaysia, Kumpulan Senureka, whom we have worked together before while I was at BIG. And uh, we kept in touch and he contacted me about this um, very large competition in uh, a new part of uh, uh, city outside Kuala Lumpur, and it was for a convention center. So it, just to briefly introduce Kuala Lumpur, what you see that this uh, urban area is uh, what we call Klang Valley. And it is a, a valley, of course, and it's um, in the center is the city of Kuala Lumpur, but where you see this pink circle is the city called Cyberjaya. And it's a city that's fairly new. It's about 30 years old now, and it's uh, meant to be a conurbation of education and high-tech sectors uh, that would, uh, complement very well with the financial sector of Kuala Lumpur. To the west on the coast is this uh, very large uh, seaport. And then to the south, uh, you'd see a very large uh, airport, so that's uh, Kuala Lumpur International Airport. And the, the brief was to develop this plot of land in pink uh, into a new uh, city surrounding a uh, convention center. The key project was the convention center. So that's what you see in square. and. Uh, master plan was actually done, given to us, and we were in charge of providing uh, uh, some urban design for this area, but surrounding the convention center, which was the key uh, part of the competition. So to the left, to the west of the site is a, a very important um, former mine area. And this is the part that I want to introduce first, our context. Our context essentially is no context. Uh, it is very typical in Asia to develop in uh, this no man's land. But uh, traditionally, uh, we would have uh, some sort of uh, either tabula rasa in the middle of nowhere or a uh, urban historical context uh, to build in. But today, for this competition, we were offered something of a both uh, in the sense that there's a new city, but it's fairly undeveloped. And then, but the landscape part is a uh, historical landscape. So it's, it was a uh, former tin mine. Uh, Malaysia made its money uh, through agriculture and rubber uh, about 120 years ago. And uh, it is around the same time, they developed this uh, tin mining industry uh, uh, brought in by the British. Uh, the, in this, the technology was brought in by the British. And so uh, this dredging uh, method of mining created very large uh, uh, tidal pools, craters, essentially, in the ground. And uh, today, what you get are these uh, very large wetlands, and they are protected by the, by the country. Uh, but to the east of the site is where we were to develop this uh, large convention center. So because of this uh, um, uh, not, uh, because of this historical context of tin mining, um, a collective uh, got together some very cool model maker to make our final model out of. Uh, Molten metal. It was an extraordinarily heavy model, but it was only uh, yay size. Uh, <laughs> it was it was uh, fantastic, and I think uh, the, uh, the the client loved it. Um, but I think, uh, but I also like to introduce this um, in a very Malaysian context. This idea of building in the tropics, um, where we are right now in Taiwan and Hong Kong, uh, it's 
the weather is, the climate is quite different from the tropics. So those who live in Singapore and Malaysia know very well that it's essentially summer all year round and it's humid. And the only real protection we have is uh, uh, trees and shades. And uh, the, the picture that we found uh, that was this, this tree that's very prevalent in Malaysia, it's, uh, there, there's a general name for it, it's called the rain tree. And, and basically it, it covers you from the rain. It's, a, it's amazing shelter and you can have tens and hundreds of people uh, basically having shade under such a tree. And uh, as we developed the project also, uh, which I will show you shortly, uh, we also had this idea of um, showing some Malaysian, uh, uh, I think not towards uh, the cultural aspect of things that are familiar with uh, in, in Malaysia. So here's a brief introduction to the client. The client is a, a sovereign state fund uh, development board, and they are in charge of the state of Selangor, where this, this uh, site is. And they are essentially in charge of, uh, 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 they are in a way developers, but it is a developing for the uh, benefit of the nation, uh, so to speak. And so um, Malaysian or very local iconography is extremely important because uh, what they are building is in a way uh, to actually uh, provide some sort of uh, Malay or Malaysian um, um, ex experience or, or uh, the, the picturesque. So we, we, I, I, I suppose it was quite helpful that uh, I was Malaysian as well. And we could point towards uh, certain uh, useful um, um, icons that uh, in, I think it was what, six weeks uh, to develop yeah. 50,000 square meters. Yes, yeah. so it was quite efficiently uh, planned in such a way that I, we, we could help in that manner. Um, but uh, I think the, the most interesting part of course was the, the developing of the project. And as a introduction of what the whole thing looks like, it's basically a convention center uh, with its massing, but which we created a, a new land, uh, a new ground on top of it in the shape of a pyramid. And the reason it's in a pyramid is really because we have an inverted black box uh, in, in, the, in the base. And what we could also do uh, was to then treat the facade in a very special way, such that they could be an extension of the urban context, uh, but at the same time, its own monolith uh, uh, in, in, in this new site. Um, but the most, the, the key aspect of the project was this auditorium area, these performance centers that um, would be the uh, uh, crown of the building, if you may. Um, so the resulting thing was to create this really large, again, umbrella or a canopy structure in the site. Now, it, we must emphasize that the iconography did not come first. They came later and it was a way of uh, finding a way to communicate with the, the clients who were not architects, who were not uh, designers, but they are just hardcore financiers and developers. So the, the iconography came later, but then the, the the massing on the program was really a large um, back and forth uh, between our office and collective, everyone in collective. And I think it's, in, uh, it's very important to say that we did not always agree uh, mm -hmm. on many things, but it was because we did not agree that I think we could have a fruitful collaboration. I think if everybody were the same, then there would be no collaboration. Then we're just copies of each other. But because there was some kind of push and pull, and, uh, and, and, and counter thoughts that we could develop things that were kind of unconventional. Uh, I think we were also quite fortunate to bring, uh, bring in Arab and we had a working relationship with uh, this man in the picture, uh, Rory McGowan, who spent many years in uh, Beijing developing the structure for the CCTV towers. And then I think that was his uh, last major project, I believe, before he returned to Ireland. Uh, we kept in touch and then uh, we worked on the skyscraper project with him earlier so with the same local architect so we could very uh, confidently say hey rory we have this crazy idea would you like to help us um, make this uh, real and in fsa he was very um, enthusiastic with um, uh, young architects and i think that was very helpful in creating this collaborative collaborative process even more uh, uh, productive and so we created this uh, system where there's the underground for parking as uh, in general, but then we had this uh, enormous base 
where we could house all of these convention centers and backup house areas. And it could be planned in such a way that uh, cars can come in on one side and pedestrians can come in on the other. And there would never be any sort of uh, uh, clash between the two. All of them would have some sort of access to the landscape park, the wetlands park surrounding the building. And the way to do that would be to access two of the facades, which would be uh, green roofs, but done in a terraced sort of way. Um, and then towards the top, uh, where we have this uh, um, crown would be the auditorium. And this was possible only because we could use the facade as uh, fire egress, and which was very helpful. We were, it was very good to have our local architects who were experts in towers and uh, fire egress. So they could have helped us make this thing work. Um, here are the plans to show the, the really dynamic uh, relationship between each floor, which is very, uh, it was almost like a different world with each uh, uh, plan that you cut. But I think all of this would be more clear in the section. Um, I think this sort of uh, push and pull also was very uh, uh, helpful, not only because of people, but I think it was helpful that the program itself was so schizophrenic. And uh, you know, the site was rather um, special, it was unusual. Um, there was this dichotomy of, is it urban, is it landscape, and then is it natural, but is it man-made? And in a way, it was a little bit of everything. And so this became a very interesting topic for us to explore. And so on uh, day zero, when I got the phone call uh, to do this project, um, we, we were very busy with other projects in Malaysia and Vietnam. So I knew we needed some kind of, uh, um, I would say, unusual minds as well to help make this an uh, interesting project. I think on the first day, we agreed also that, hey, it's OK if we did not win <laughs> this competition. <laughs> but it's important that we come up with something that we really believed in. And it really helped to make something really unusual. And I think uh, we had two other competitors. And we were never told who they were. All we were told was one was a very large British company, and the other was a very large Australian company. And we were the wild cards. Who, uh, a Malaysian local company, uh, and they invited us, um, the international team, to collaborate with them. And so that was sort of how this whole thing came about. Um, Rory's uh, Arab's help was in uh, developing uh, fire egress, but as, as well as a structure. Uh, we were wondering how on earth are we going to make this thing uh, stable and uh, and not tilt. And so uh, through, again, this very wild um, collaborative process, uh, the team developed a very unusual uh, structural system, which was working in both tension and compression that held the, um, the inverted pyramid together to prevent it from tilting, but at the same time, uh, keeping the entire thing in tension in such a way that it would uh, resist uh, lateral winds as well and seismic movement. So um, again, the, 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 the result was really unusual, but I think everyone was really uh, excited about how new and how um, I would say unique the project was. And uh, in a way, uh, in this picture, we would see the, uh, the pedestrian entrance. Uh, and in the, in the previous picture was the car boulevard entrance. And so we created some sort of iconography that was visible on four different sides such that they would be different uh, with every angle, but at the same time provides a very distinct silhouette that um, to some extent would also disappear uh, in view from a different angle. So the choice of uh, uh, metal cladding that resembled the tin uh, uh, mining of the site was also a nod towards the historical context, but at the same time it created a very surreal effect of, of, of the vanishing building. And, and I think this kind of uh, uh, approach to project, I think was very suitable for this uh, unusual uh, competition. And so I think I want to end a little bit with uh, this, this last image or the second last image, which was this, again, the dichotomy of the, the project, which worked really well with the, also the, the dichotomy of everyone in the team where everyone was in a little bit different. Um, and uh, uh, had a very different point of view, but at the same time, we came from a very similar way of working that uh, we did not have to adjust or, or uh, calibrate ourselves, but we knew exactly when we needed to be different, we knew exactly when we needed to be the same. Um, so uh, unfortunately, 
<laughs> we had this lost uh, sticker, but I, I have to I have to emphasize that we did not actually lose this project uh, yet. Um, the <laughs> at the end of the competition, Malaysia was thrown into some form of um, political uh, turmoil and instability. You may have read about it in the papers, but the change of government had sort of ushered this project out of the picture and it remains a very low priority for the government at this moment. But I guess <laughs> never say never, right? So um, um, yeah, thank you again. I hand you back, uh, hand this back to you, Betty. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to its revival. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will uh, then share my screen again. Sorry, guys, one second. All right. So indeed, we didn't lose, we didn't lose yet. <laughs> it's gonna be revived. But um one of the reasons that we thought um it's important to bring men into this conversation is. I think we all have the experience of working on competition with your friends, and they usually don't work out. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very important for us uh, to bring this up because I think the idea of collective has a lot to do with collaboration. Um, by creating good relationship with your collaborators, meaning your consultants or your clients, or even within the team, uh, as Min said, we don't actually always agree with each other. But it's the same between the four directors or even with our team too. But uh, it's the idea of how do you create a good conversation uh, and not to take this, let's say, personally, and it's all about the project. We have learned a lot and we had such a great time working with Min. Uh, we were very inspired. Uh, also, we love the project very much. So um, with this, again, the idea of bringing competition in is competition has been very draining. It always buys us hope. Uh, but we have actually never really win uh, a big competition. Um, we were almost commissioned at UCCA in Chengdu, lost. We participated in a commercial tower bit, lost. Uh, we started going super crazy on doing competition because we believe we can do it. We have the experience um, and we want to buy a chance. We want to create opportunity for ourselves. And I'm sure all of us here have done competition and feel the same. We collaborated with our friends uh, back at OMA. They have their own firm called 7478 in Rotterdam. Um, they were people that were uh, very, very instrumental in creating a lot of very good buildings in OMA. Um, so we were colleagues and we decided to do project together. And uh, this is a project that we have, well, a competition that we have entered. Uh, Obviously, we lost. Um, and then we started doing the next one, also with uh, 7478. Uh, we also lost. And then uh, we started doing it ourselves because they started to get very tired of competition too. Uh, but at that moment, we were sort of at a momentum. It was like, oh, let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. Uh, so we participate in the Sunjin Finance uh, Cultural Center. And uh, at that moment, we were like, let's forget about winning. Let's test ideas. So it's almost kind of like a workout that our office started doing to keep ourselves fit uh, in designing. Uh, so here we tested uh, certain architectural ideas uh, and then we move on the next doing something that we have never done before, hospitals. Um, so we sort of study hospital and try to like think of several things. For example, hospitals has kind of an exponential need of growth. How do you actually allow hospital to grow and keep building what they need? Secondly, uh, logistic and circulation is always very difficult. So we were focusing on these two elements and trying to design a complex that can um, experiment on creating very straightforward circulation and also uh, basically a, a almost have a rasa kind of situation of allowing a hospital to grow as much as they need. Obviously we lost, we didn't even get into the final. Um, Bike Dance is a very famous company uh, so we decided to go back in designing um, towers and uh, we started looking into uh, the programmatic elements, uh, but then at the same time we're trying to control ourselves so that the tower doesn't look too crazy. 
but then the interior situation uh, has a lot to about like combining what tech companies nowadays want of public programs. Um, there was a time when ByteDance was kind of engaged in this kind of crazy news in the, in the States uh, and the composition showed them like didn't go for it. So we consider that lost. The last one we lost <laughs> was the Sun Jim and Group Museum. Um, very famous firm got selected. Um, we actually quite like this uh, result that we come up with. We're toying with a very new idea of creating the leanest museum ever. Uh, we were studying the context of Sun Jun, and they have a big master plan uh, of connecting the green parks together. Uh, and then we wanted to create a mangrove museum that is not a giant building sitting in the middle of seeing mangrove on TV screen. But we cre created the mangrove and create a very lean kind of pathway driven museum to be inserted in the mangrove. So one can actually be immersed in nature. So a mangrove museum is about nature. It's not about TV screens. So we designed the museum with these screens that are for bird watching. So we, we study what the bird watching tower is like, and we created a series of um, facade and trajectories and pathway to observe mangrove, basically immerse yourself in biodiversity. And after all these losses, uh, we can't help but start to think How, how big is good? We keep losing competition and a lot of feedbacks we get are, oh, you guys are a very small firm. And I was like, but we have 17 to 20 people in America or in Europe is considered a mid-sized firm. Uh, in Hong Kong it's not. Hong Kong is considered to be a tiny size firm and that you are incapable of taking up projects, which is completely not true. Uh, we don't speak with arrogance here, we speak with experience. And, it, we can't stop, but you know, can't help but think about nowadays in 2021 after six years, Collective has been very lucky. We are doing architectural commission, but how do we move forward? How do we get commission? How big is considered to be a competent firm? The size really matters. So uh, we want to end with a few slides today uh, to initiate this discussion. The size matters. Uh, what is the context of Hong Kong? Architectural Record published this very interesting article in 2018 called The Future of Practice Medium Firms. Uh, and then they have this list of um, for American firms, uh, which you guys, we are all very familiar with. And uh, what we found quite interesting is to look into uh, the experiences of various, let's say, well known firms. Uh, Michael Mosen loved his work. Uh, the office made really, really interesting work. They're at 30 people. And uh, what I found quite interesting is that they are competing against a very wide range of firms with large corporate firms and even small emerging firms. And this is exactly what Collective is facing nowadays. Um, competitions. We all know competition bias hope, but it is seriously a losing financial proposal for any firms. Um, it's almost kind of a drain of intelligence and effort and resources, but we still do it. Is there a better way to do competition? Do we actually need competition? Um, and there are seemingly positive examples, particular in the context of America, it seems like. For example, Dylan and Scovideo, now we all know, uh, they are a very big firm. But um, according to this article uh, back in uh, 2009, they only have really one building, ICA in Boston. All of a sudden, they won six competition, and within a year, they have grown from 40 to 80 people. Last but not least, uh, Seldorf Architects. Um, it's a firm that does focus a lot on uh, arts and culture, very beautiful projects. Uh, and I particularly like uh, this point of view of, it's always not clear when to make a leap. I think right now Collective is facing this uh, threshold. Do we grow or do we not grow? How do we grow or should we grow? And here, uh, South of Architects made a point that a mid-sized firm, um, when you grow, you actually manage to bring in more opportunities and also do projects that are larger, more complex, or even global. Um, collective always have an aim to be rooted in Asia. And uh, from our project portfolio, I'm sure you guys also realize that we always wanted to be international. And uh, talking about projects that are larger, complex, and even global, uh, I would like to bring up our collaboration with Min again. I thought it was a very, very good example of smaller firms should work together, share resources. 
um, it does seem a little naive, but uh, with our experience with men, there is ways that we can work out. So I would like to end the presentation uh, further in discussing these two matters. It's like, what, how big is, how big does a firm needs to be in order to be seen as capable? And the size really matters. Uh, we wanted to bring this question forward for everyone to, to think about. I'm sure there's a lot of um, you know, young practitioner here and we face very similar problem. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, sorry, it's a bit long. <laughs> Well, thank you, Betty. Um, maybe we can also invite uh, our um, participants online if they have any questions. We can also submit a question through the chat box or the Q&A box. And I wonder if you have any question or what, any topic you want to discuss. Maybe I can start, make a really quick comment or observation. Yeah, please. I think it's very interesting. Like two <laughs> days ago, we actually uh, had a talk by Sean, mm. Sean Chow. Mm -hmm. of Acom, yeah. which is the, probably one of the biggest firms mm -hmm. you know, today. Yeah. And I, and you now today you brought up this um, this idea about the size or, or yes. the scale of mm -hmm. the practice and how was the, and then the idea between size and capacity, mm -hmm. you know, that does number equals to the capacity, say the design capacity or the capacity to deliver creative, um, design solution in the built environment. Maybe that's um, something we can open up uh, for a discussion. And because you mentioned Michael also, mm -hmm. you know, before I came back and worked for Michael. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. And what I observed um, when I was working there was that um, it's actually what you would say is the, the resources doesn't have to be within the firm itself. You know, it's mm -hmm. about also um, through your um, the support, say the support from your client mm -hmm. or your patron. Say Michael had a lot of collaboration with say um, Hammer Museum in LA or say MIT um, for some of the uh, dormitory and institutional buildings. So they actually also inject a lot of the support and support in terms of not only, so the architect is not alone fighting the battle or they're trying mm -hmm. to deal with the project the way he or she wants, but also the the, the clients, everything, everyone around the project also inject their resources to bring this project alive. Then the architects, the role of the architect is really the um, the one who's orchestrating all these resources and allocate the resource to the place that, mm. uh, that will be used uh, in the most efficient way. Mm. Well, coming from a bigger firm, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do think that the scale of the projects that you are interested or going want to go after it it does ties into to the size of the of mm. the firm a lot. I mean, just for example, our office is doing a huge project for for HKUST, mm. and and if you think about it. It does need a, an office of that size to be able to service that that kind of project, mm. and and it has to do with something very basic financially, where you're able to not receiving a fee for like two months, and then running an overhead of over maybe twenty millions mm. of, uh, of of Hong Kong dollars mm. uh, in order to sustain that, and and so I, I think. It really comes down to like your goal as to what kind of scale mm -hmm. of the projects, yeah, that that it has to, and also the resources that you you're going after. But certainly, I think collaborations with other firms helps extremely uh, with, with your case um, uh, with different specialties. I mean, even us being a big firm, we also collaborate with a lot of offices just because like we don't know everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so like whether it's a small firm or big firm, like we collaboration is still very much ingrained, I think, in the practice. Yeah. I think right now for a practice like ourselves, um, we have between 17 to 20 people. Mm -hmm. and it, it is really a, a threshold for us at this moment. Right. Where the directors were already discussing, do we grow? Should we grow? How do mm -hmm. we grow? Or should we not grow? 
because now we still know everyone, right? We can still share new with everyone and know everyone's name and their life. Um, and once we grow, uh, what does that mean? The whole system also needs to change. And we feel like, or at least myself, because I do a lot of the management of the office. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't think I know enough of how to run a business. And uh, I started to think of like, oh, maybe we can take this opportunity to also hear out from people who have experience um, to also guide younger firms like ourselves. Like, how do you actually grow? And I, I thought that can be quite interesting uh, as a topic. But from what you've presented, it seems that, you know, you, you enjoy what you're doing and you build a culture that really excels at it. Is growth suddenly now an objective? Growth an objective? Well, you know, is um, it a means or an end? Well, I, Why is it? I feel like the narrative we have today, uh, I show a lot of losses. Loss, 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 loss. I think she has an ambitions to do certain kind of projects, yeah, yeah. which with the current size doesn't allow her to do it. Yeah. yeah, it was almost yes, kind of relearned. I was like, oh, we keep losing. Well, first of all, I guess fame is one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing is, are you capable? That's always mm -hmm. the question, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, we have um, Christian Low um, to Betty's question. Thank you. Uh, in the chat box, it says, in my experience, size of firm are driven by preference of firm leaders regarding the scale of project that you choose to mm -hmm. undertake but also relates to how close and hands-on the partners want to remain to each and every project. Mm -hmm. Directors have to be highly motivated to grow because it requires a certain amount of bonies and uh, leadership be inserted. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes, that's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, one thing that the four directors mm -hmm. are like in collective is that we're extremely hands-on. Mm. Yeah, extremely yeah. well yeah we have we have had comments uh clients commenting that we are maybe a little yeah. too hands-on yeah. <laughs> yeah. Business leadership. Yeah. oh business leadership yeah. yeah thank you christian yeah christian has moved to bangkok so it's one of our members oh. yeah yeah i think i think what's interesting um is also that um, my, from my own experience, you know, I was working in a very, in a much larger office prior to this mm -hmm. that had a very competent setup, um, mm -hmm. as, as most very larger corporate firms do now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we were asked to do if, um, you know, we, I wasn't at a partner level or anything at that point. So you were really able to solely design manage, let's say, mm -hmm. um, and really work on a project very, very hands-on mm -hmm. um, and also have a variety of um, senior mid-level people that are all very, very, very competent um, and are all able to run different aspects of a project on, on their own. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we are also now learning in a smaller office how to balance the amount of time that we commit to, to each project. And also as more projects come in, um, <coughs> we, are, we are having to divert our attention. Mm -hmm. When in, in an older, in, when I was at HDM, you really were able to focus on one project. Mm -hmm. You knew every single aspect of that one project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something we're learning to balance is how, how much time do we commit and how involved are we with, with trying to do our first large architecture project, mm -hmm. um, but also um, trying to sit together and really discuss the administrative aspects of running a smaller office. Mm -hmm. You know, we we were saying half the time we're talking actually about um, how do we organize the office, like from a very practical point of view, like our folder structure, um, the, oh, the type of people <laughs> we, we, we hire, what kind of a timesheet system should we use? We, we all have different kinds of experiences um, bringing, uh, we think this is how it works best and this is how I've been doing it for the last nine years. So th those are always very interesting, but actually time consuming conversations mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. since it's, it's, we're essentially starting from a, from scratch, but also trying to like take things that we know that we think work best from different bigger offices mm -hmm. to try to make it work. And I, I come from uh, an HDM <laughs> kind of a system, Betty and Hande and, and Katya come from like an OMA system. So. That's actually also been very interesting for us to oh, see, yes. <laughs> to see, you know, those due to the, the different points of views and where it's very similar and where it's actually a little bit different. Yeah, quite different. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have more Q and A. Oh, Nelson. No, oh, no. hi, Nelson. Not a question, but a word of encouragement to the innovative team at Collective. 
The concept of small as beautiful can be challenging to succeed in contemporary architectural practice, perhaps especially in Hong Kong and China, where rapid urbanization and development are dominated by large developers and their large consultancies, including architectural and engineering firms of commonly 200 or more staff. Hopefully there are still discerning clients who have discovered that small is the new big for more attentive professional service. Oh, Nelson, this is our new slogan. Small is the new big. <laughs> the future of practice is medium-sized firm. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson. Well, we see a few familiar names. Um, guys, you want to ask us anything? <laughs> <laughs> so for the four of you, it sounded like because there is there a division of labor like in terms of specialties? Hmm. You talk and talk and talk, but it's yeah. on the same subject. How, how does it work between the four of you? I think for efficiency, we have to be have this division of, of work because right. we cannot, four people doing the same thing <laughs> right. all the time, yeah. then they cannot help the goal of the office. So I think from the, we are also learning <sighs> from, from, a, from a small firm, from three of us, and then we have four of us, and then we do trying to divide our works more efficiently. So who is best to doing what? Actually kind of, um, it's not planned, it just happens. It's not a natural selection. Yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah like Benny will just deal with the context. Like <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it is actually quite, I mean, before this lecture, I actually spoke to a few of our team members. Mm. I was like, how, how do you think you work? And I asked them, and uh, one of them, Desmond, started drawing a diagram, and I thought that was quite interesting, uh, because he was analyzing while drawing, and uh, he was like, it's actually quite complex, the way that we work a collective. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, tell me. <laughs> and uh, he started drawing a small bubble, uh, which he has a team, another small bubble <laughs> where Cartier has a team, but then a bubble that connects Cartier and Chi together, because they're both running King Lab. Uh, the commercial project. And then he drew smaller bubbles that some of the smaller teams that Betty is leading, uh, uh, let's say project managing. And then he drew a very big bubble around all the teams, including myself, Chi, and Katia with Juan over it because Juan is our design police. <laughs> so he will sit in most of our design reviews. He will um, basically deal a lot with uh, maintaining the concept or like, how do we do the details that we can maintain the concept? There's always a concept policing. And then he drew another bigger bubble over Juan, which then Betty jumped back out because then there is this management aspect of things. Mm. But then he sort of big a big cross on the diagram. Like, no, 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 <laughs> that's actually not really true either. Because then as Katia also said, Betty, she, Katia, you know, and Juan, we always come together and discuss things. We also seek help of each other. Uh, sometimes when I'm leading a small project, I'll be like, hey guys, I need help. Can we have a design meeting? And then like Katia and she will sit in. And sometimes we even um, invite team members. It's like, guys, you guys have experience doing this. Let's sit in and talk about the uh, projects that other teams are working on. So we, we drive the studio. Uh, we wish to drive the studio as a, as a studio. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we reviews. We do a lot of reviews. But I think we we also sometimes realize that there are certain moments when when we realize oh there are four directors sitting in a small design meeting in which that is potentially not <laughs> so losing efficient <laughs> like if you were calculating by the hour yeah. Yeah. Right. so I think we also realize that there are moments when if there are moments later maybe if the office does grow that yeah. we will have to be comfortable with each of us making design decisions independently mm -hmm. or with more of a less of a consent a group consensus let's say right, right? which because of scheduling <laughs> because we just don't have time to sit together that we'll have to get yeah. to a point where we're we would be you know as I think most most projects in probably bigger offices partners really run independently from each other 
Um, so, but we very much at this point, we really are still in each other's business, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a way to allow people to talk? Yeah. Like that. Oh, but then they need to indicate who wants to talk. Right? They have to raise their hand, right? Oh, anyone wants to raise their hand? We would love to have a conversation. Sorry, we're new to the webinar. But if anyone would love to, oh, we have Dennis here. Ah, from uh, RDA, who's working with us on the King Lamb Street project. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. <laughs> and then we have Eric. Eric uh, used to work with us at OMA, and he runs his uh, firm. Oh, this. Oh, Dennis. Yes. Hand. Dennis, you, you can speak now because you raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric runs his firm in Indonesia. <laughs> Hi, Dennis. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks for coming. Hello. Do you have a comment or a question? <laughs> oh, just, just enjoying the speech. <laughs> I, I think it's introduce it's great to introduce Dennis um um to to I mean we consider Dennis I consider Dennis very okay, much a, yeah. a very close working oh, yes. um uh colleague in a way because I have worked very closely with Dennis um he uh, Dennis um is is from RDA uh, Rocco Design Architects who I worked very closely with um on the uh, the Daigun project um and uh very interestingly, by the stroke of luck, we are all. I am now also working with um, Dennis on uh, the King Lamb Street project um, here at Collective, and so it's it's very interesting that, um, of course, Hong Kong. We know that the networks are quite small, uh, but it's even rarer that I get to work twice, very very closely with the same person uh, who is my executive architect, um, and there's a lot of. Um, I think uh, I mean you can speak more about this, Dennis. I mean we all know we all know each other quite well, um, and it's really great that in Hong Kong we have, um, we have these very very strong um, uh, firms, Hong Kong firms that know everything about um, the Hong Kong statutory rules. Um, we work very very closely together. I think very successful in the last few years. So that's just yes. to introduce Dennis. <laughs> yes. I think I think I think it it is actually been an entirely enjoyable working with you guys on um on Kingdom Street, and um I think um um seeing seeing your post about um the pro the project being 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 published on magazine, um I think um I think this moment has been been waiting for for a few years already. So so it's been very exciting to to see that happen, and um being able to um to see um. Your your projects, um, especially those um hard work you've been um going through all these years, I think it's been it's been very rewarding. I think, and um and also I think I think after Tycoon after working with Chi, um I think um the 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 journey from through Tycoon was very enjoyable, um and also the, the dynamic of working as as a local architect with the um the foreign architects um on Tycoon was uh, very very exciting, so um. Being able to to work again um, with with Chi and um, the rest of you guys um, is actually a very um, rewarding moment, especially after Tycoon, because uh, usually when you when you got a local projects, um, I think um, uh, I think that most of the energy um, being put in is is mostly on the um, um, commercial side of how how the project is is going to be um, be built and and how how it's going to be uh, implemented. So, so being able to work with you guys, um, having so much um, sort of energy in terms of the design input, I think um, it's, it's, it's been a very, very, very enjoyable journey, I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're really proud of the family. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Thank hey, you. Paul. Thank you so much. Yes, we thank you. Hey, Paul, you have a question. I just made you, uh, you can talk. Which yes, hi. Uh, can, you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hi, well, thanks guys uh, for the great talk. And um, yes, you know, always very inspiring to see, um, you know, what other people are doing and, you know, kind of also uh, in a certain way share similar issues uh, in terms of like, you know, um, practicing in Hong Kong and, you know, being a small firm and all that. Uh, my, my question actually is more related to, um, you know, your, your kind of, um, you know, very great um, previous experiences. 
um, all of you, you know, went to um, very established um, architectural offices before, and then also um, study, you know, at uh, at various institutes. Um, and the question is, like, you know, obviously operating as a small firm, it's going to be very different than you know the previous firms that you were working at. Um, you know, we don't have that much resources, and we also don't have, let's say, like that much. Um, um, network or you know connections and obviously then the way that you practice would have to be different too right so are there any sort of conscious uh, or like you know deliberate thing that you you sort of um, tell yourself oh actually you know we we can't operate exactly like you know let's say OMA or HDM but then we have to sort of do something else I'm just kind of very interested in uh, you know if there's anything, because I, you know, obviously you have learned a lot and then you implement a lot from those great experiences, but there must be also things that you think, ah, oh, actually we can't really do things like that way. Like we have to do it like this other way. You can't charge the same hourly rate. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. Well, I guess, first of all, um, we were employees in our previous firms. Mm -hmm. And I think that already make a big difference. Uh, right. Now. This is our lifeline. Uh, in a way, if the office doesn't do well, we don't get paid and we can't pay people. And that's another heavy layer of concern. And that drives sometimes how we make decisions. Um, previously, we enjoy, we were quite spoiled. I always use the word spoiled because we enjoy very good clients. We have a great team. We don't need to worry about PL so much. We only need to worry about like, at least at OMA, do the best project you can. This spirit continues in collective. Uh, I can proudly say it does. But of course, as I mentioned, there are money concerns. I mean, she blatantly just saying we can't charge the same. Can we deliver the same? And maybe in terms of uh, architectural concepts or you know that kind of vibe and energy, yes. But do we have that much resources? No. We don't have the best pool of people necessarily applying to our office which also means we don't necessarily get the best fee to offer the best salary. And these are all realities. Um, so I would say because of our role is switch, we are now business owners and we need to bear the responsibility in running an office. There's a lot of things we need to adjust and adopt. But in terms of the spirit of design, I think we didn't change if, if I can put it that way. Yeah. I, I think we, we are... We, we haven't been forced yet into the position where we've had to compromise too much in terms True. of the way we work and the way we design and what we want to deliver. We still hold very much onto what we have learned from our, our old jobs. Um, it, it's almost, I mean, we always say this, like, oh, we, we wouldn't know how to design this otherwise or how else to have come up with a solution had we not gone through this sort of process or, or looking at many options. Um, which in some offices might be, um, it seems a bit inefficient, you know, we, we spend so long discussing one small thing. It, it's almost as if yeah. we haven't yet learned to forget how, how to work. So we, we feel that the things that we're producing are at least still at the same level of design we would have been held to mm -hmm. at our old, uh, the offices. Uh, but, but indeed, it's still a, it's a conversation that does come up about, yeah. um, the efficiency and how how you know how strongly we want we need to hold on and push and fight for uh, certain concepts versus um, you know we we just don't have that much time to spend on developing and convincing and, and bringing everybody to our side. Yes. Yeah. To me, one observation is about the limitation of people we work together like. Like in our main time, we used to work with the best consultant in the world. Like we have all the best team for structural engineering or <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah. And we can always talk to them like very professionally. But then in this small firm, I think when we, the projects are quite different mm -hmm. and uh, we do not get to work with the best team like, like, like as, as if in, yeah. in our main time. So I think there's, this is an observation. It's not the things that we cannot do, but then I think for us, we need to push more for the design we want to achieve. Uh, it's not the same at the same time at, as OMA, we can uh, discuss design like more easily. Like yeah. we can push for our design more easily, but then now we have to explain and explain because we are working with different um, teams, different like 
consultants and we yeah. have to promote ourselves as a, the, the design a bit more, like push a bit more. And yeah, yeah. I guess having said that, it's also almost re replying to Paul's question again, like we actually didn't really change our work of way of yeah. working. <laughs> yeah, we're always just, in a positive way, I would describe, we're very naive. We still want the concept to go through, but we are informedly naive. Like, you know, we have built things, we have a certain experience, but we still have certain insistence of conceptual drive. And um, in the context of Hong Kong, once in a while, indeed, we have found that it's very hard to push that naivety through, uh, particularly with, um, you know, some level of consultants, yeah. But then we maintain that drive to either either babysit or be very patient or we do more in order to still try to achieve what we want to achieve, yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for the answers. And yeah, I, I think it's very important to sort of still um, be able to persist. And, you know, because there's just so much forces that um, like kind of coming towards you and, you know, to maybe in a certain sense, slow you down. But I think, yeah, it's really important to kind of keep that spirit alive. Yeah, we should work on a project together. <laughs> and but, I'm going to drag you into this inefficiency. <laughs> no, because, like, you know, in our office, like, there's also obviously a huge amount of inefficiency, too. Uh, you know, I think um, you know, that's why I, I wanted to raise this question because, for example, like, um, you know, in, in this, um, those established design firms, like, they have the resource and they have the sort of, um, um, let's say, the, the bargaining power, let's say, to sort of um, push, uh, push on through. But then um, again, like, you know, even though we have limited resource, but then we still try to operate in a certain level um, similar uh, uh, to those um, bigger practices. But then I'm always kind of questioning, um, you know, obviously like when, let's say, OMA first started, like they also didn't operate like they are now, right? Or HDM, they didn't operate like they are now. So then, you know, whether there should be any sort of adjustment in terms of like efficiency or like how you approach, um, you know, design and, and design process and all that. Yeah, you know, I never actually thought we were ever in a disadvantage, honestly, uh, despite being smaller and there's a lot of losses. <laughs> but in terms of uh, design capability and how we run and the energy and the spirit, I never thought we were in any disadvantage at all. Uh, in terms of so-called limited resources, yes, but we always find our way. Uh, yes. we, we always, I think Collective is really a team of people that hustle a lot. We always find a way to do things. And of course, to accept failure is part of it. Uh, with all the losses that we have, but in a way it's almost like, all right, let's, let's try it again. Let's do it again. Yeah. Or try to evaluate and ponder, how do we grow? How do we not grow? How do we tackle this? Um, I, I think our team is always very positive, or maybe I am very positive, that we are always thinking of how to solve it and just move forward. Hey, Eric. <laughs> Let me, am I gonna put, hey, Eric, how are you doing? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Eric and us used to work together at OMA, and uh, he's running a practice in Indonesia now. Well, I have a question. Yes, so, please. Um, it, it's very clear that you know the value of collaborating through the design process is you know a great way of working and makes a lot of sense. But what are the benefits you see in collaborating on the business side? And do you have sort of a structure or a method of making decisions amongst the four of you when it comes to these questions of growing or not growing or you know going for a project or not project is there not going for it um do you sort of take some of the same strategies you use in the collaborative design project or are there other sort of influences on how you're trying to approach collaborative business decisions <laughs> That's a difficult question. Yeah. I, I think recently the four of us also came together and said, hey, how do we decide on what project to take and not to take? Because uh, there was, a, let's say, a few incidents. One incident is certain director wants to take this and certain director doesn't. And uh, in the end, it really takes someone to sort of, in quote, 
back down to understand that you know we all need to feel comfortable and uh, if you don't want to take it fine we don't take it but then uh, we, I think we all uh, we respect each other enough that we are open to tell hey I don't feel good about that decision but I respect that and uh, and then we discuss why and maybe next time we can reconsider you know and uh, I, I for me personally I think it's a lot about openness mm -hmm. and being understanding and respect uh, but of course I, I feel like this is I mean we have all observed partnership in bigger firms there's always you know abrasion or you know goodness you know they all come together in various ways um, it's going to be a challenge I think if we grow uh, I think we are all aware of that uh, but at this time we are still in quote inefficient enough to sit down and discuss uh, and we try to get a consent you know. mm -hmm. So, but for so far, it's been working quite well. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I think, well, I think what is interesting for me is that um, I am I am now in a position to to be in these business conversations or uh, conversations not necessarily about the design of a of a project, but really about you know like do we hire someone to 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 manage our social, uh, you know, it, you know. There's so so. What's interesting is for me to now be in a position to discuss with um, a team about like the realities of running an office um, in all the practical ways. Like, do we hire a helper to clean? How many days a week? <laughs> Things like that. That I think we, you know, from an again from an office, you don't really have to think about because it's kind of all there. So these are all decisions that we. We want to. Um, it has been made maybe before before I joined, but then it's it's like all suddenly it's open to discussion because somehow something is not working again. Right, you move offices and you're like, yeah, and then we're gonna yeah. Sleep who's, is, is someone gonna be cool? in charge of this and that? Like mundane, very 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 mundane things. So yeah, we braced off everything. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think we we do uh, at this point we still discuss like all of those things amongst yeah. ourselves. Um, and we we agree uh, um, or we we let it sit until <laughs> until something happens like guys we have to actually <laughs> deal with this no one is taking care of uh, washing the sink or whatever <laughs> um, so I think that uh, it's it's interesting for me you know kind of piggybacking on what um, Betty Katia and Juan has built in the last few years and now getting a, a, a say and, and kind of making like very boring kind of office decisions and we do I think all are part of it in a way. Uh, and we, we try to also, I think, help out when we can to lighten Betty's load because in a way she's she's in a way doing a lot of the, 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 the networking, let's say the overall managing, which you start to realize how much work that is for one person to take on um, in, in terms of like mental energy, right? She's kind of like mothering the office. And it's like, how do you share that kind of mothering load um, and that we all take on a little bit of that. <laughs> like like just the, the fact of having yeah. to stress out about something that is maybe not working so well. Um, I think it's like, we we try to see where we, we can offload some of those things that I think she thinks a little bit more about while we're focusing always on the projects more. Um, but yeah. And this is the amazing thing about having collaborators. It's, I really cannot do this alone. No. So it's, I think everyone who wants to sell the firm should consider having others. <laughs> you really need to work together in order to make things work. Yeah. Uh, doing it alone is a myth, mm -hmm. a big myth, yeah. And do you like observe or experience any the advantage of being a smaller size firm versus- Advantage? You, yeah. Absolutely, versus very flexible, yeah. yeah. We can change things like this, mm -hmm. yeah. It's not working, let's do it, let's change, yeah. Uh, but then there's also a, a catch-22 because now we're getting a little bigger and then as, as she said we observe something's not working uh, then we sort of like need to go through a trial era and then you realize that it's also getting a little more inefficient so the bigger you get you know the less flexible you sort of become too um, so we're, we're learning through well not as failure but like we're it's there's a lot of trial and error happening but I love um, in a way I do struggle, we do want to grow, but at the same time, I love being small too, because we just maneuver things so fast, you know? It's super flexible. More questions? 
Um, do you think it would be yeah. helpful? I mean, because we were trained to be an architect, but now we're trained, we're not being trained to run a business, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be helpful if we, you know, or you hire someone that can manage business, mm -hmm. um, you know, to assist you to develop the business or to assist you to manage your office or something like this? Yeah. Because I think essentially, if we start a business, mm -hmm. we are learning by doing, right? Yes. Because we definitely develop a trial, that trial and errors. Like humans response to management, all those kind of stuff. We didn't we didn't learn yes. at all. Yeah. So do you think it would be helpful if you include someone yeah. that is specialized in running business into Oh, this is our dream. Absolutely <laughs> straight up a dream. Yeah. And I mean if you look at even the OMA, um, one of the partners that left, he grew the office. He used to run Skipple Airport. Look at big. They grew so big and they have a CEO that runs their business. Yeah. Um, I personally, because now I'm being put in the position to also like manage and try to learn operation, I started reading a lot about these. And you're right, we are completely not equipped to, to run a business. But again, uh, we're very lucky. Uh, I reach out to a lot of mentors and there's a lot of people who offer advice. But I do wish, particularly at this moment, that you know I, we are asking the question, do we grow or do we not grow? Uh, I, I wish I can like, you know, have a person that I can like sit down and talk to who have went through this before. Uh, that would be very, very helpful to have sold. But the dream is definitely to have a partner that understand our desire to create, but at the same time can control us um, and manage the business. If you guys know anyone, <laughs> <laughs> let us know. <laughs> Yeah, that's also one of the reasons why we organized this series of, of you know, talk so that we can also um, share this knowledge. You know, they're not, not, not just one talk, but also these talks by different architects in different regions and like also learn together, you know, how to practice in the day as well. Yeah, this is great. Any questions? <laughs> share the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Min. Hey. Thanks for being here with us. Um, Thank you for inviting. You, yeah, you you were also you are also running a, a firm. How many people do you have now? Oh, we have uh, six. We, we we were actually uh, planning to grow more, uh, to yeah. grow bigger, and then COVID happened. Yeah, and it was very strange because most uh, we're based in Taipei, Taipei yes. Yeah? So uh, during COVID, um, architecture companies in Taiwan actually grew because Taiwan was relatively stable and many mm -hmm. businesses were moving back to Taiwan. So there was a lot of construction, but we were in a weird place because many of our projects were overseas. So we, on the other hand, suffered during this period. So we shrank at that time um, and then tried to take on more Taiwanese projects instead. Um, but yes, it's, it's been a challenge. And, and actually I've been wanting to um, say something about how um, the premise of this talk today basically is growing the company, yes, uh, in the context for a collective. But I want to, in, in my opinion, um, I think that the conditions in which companies grew, uh, say, 30 or 40 years ago, um, uh, compared to the conditions in which we grow today, they're quite different. I think um, there are, first of all, there's a lot more regulation, there's a lot more uh, um, consultants that are needed for any single project, no matter the size. And I think the clients are also very different. Um, I think uh, a friend of mine used to joke to me that uh, if Louis Kahn were to live in our age, his, his, the way his, his stature would have been a lot more different. And in the past, he would have very uh, eager clients to, to, who would be very impressed by certain things. But today, things are very different. And, uh, you know, for example, clients would be less interested in the sculptural thing, but more interested in your Excel sheet and your area numbers. And so um, I think that at least that's what I'm experiencing here in Taiwan. And I'm sure it's quite similar in Hong Kong for uh, growing companies. And so um, I don't have a solution to what, uh, how to handle all of these new conditions, but I think it's a, a learning process that for sure, um, at least on our end. Thank you, Min. Yeah. We miss you here, actually. <laughs> we should find a project to work together again. That's back to Malaysia soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Thank you everyone for joining us tonight, especially on everyone online. And thank you um, for all the comments and questions that we hear today. Um, just one more <laughs> comment and then we can wrap up you know, for tonight. Oh, oh, Christian. Christian mentioned he's happy to have a side call with us to chat about firm growth. Hi. Oh, Catherine. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My advertising help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, I'll get your contact, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Min. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Good night.